Bryce and Sam, thank you so much for joining me today. Super excited to chat with you guys. And Bryce, okay, you are the co-founder of Omega Runner. Yes. Which is oh, Omega Runner is a Web3 native storytelling universe that is creating a world story and brand. We'll dive more into that very soon. Sam, you are a, also a co-founder of o Omega Runner. In addition, you work at Metaversal as well. And Metaversal is building the world's most impactful community in Web3. You guys invest, co-produce, and partner with those building in Web3. So before diving into that, I would love to hear about your guys' backgrounds. Bryce, would you mind telling me about your background and how you got in, into this world? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think the start of it is my day job is in Hollywood. I work for a film producer, Brian Unclis, actually, who's the founder of Clubhouse Pictures and also the co-founder of Runner with us. He and I worked together for about eight years. And before that, I was at Warner Brothers. Before that, I was at UTA. When we think about our day jobs, what we do is we take movies from idea, like just the, the very sparkle in your eye kind of inception to all the way to production and release. So we're all about, you know, new ways to take media and create media and put it out into the world for global audiences. As far as the Web3 side of things, I've been in crypto a really long time. I started trading Bitcoin in about 2013. It was just a side hub, like side hobby. Because I stuck through it through 2017 and through, you know, those markets when the ramp up in NFT started happening in early 2021, I was in the right place. I knew exactly what people were talking about. I remember watching the first big art sale and it was like, oh my God, this is the intersection of my two worlds, which is art and culture and, you know, media properties and crypto, which I just sort of been in, you know, not professionally, but as my day job, uh, but as my like side, you know, hobby. And I started talking about this with Brian and it was like, okay, what happens? How do we as a company position ourselves to, you know, take advantage of this moment where you have culture coming to blockchain? And what does that look like for our industry going forward? And what does that look like for media in general? And that was really the beginning of the conversation about Runner. That's awesome. All right, Sam, tell me about, you know, how'd you get involved with Metaversal? How'd you come to be a co-founder of uh, uh, Omega Runner? Tell me, tell me that journey. So my background is actually pretty unconventional. Uh, I'm a trained classical musician by trade. And prior to 2020, I was actually doing that full time. The pandemic actually was the reason why I went into Web3. Because at the time, you know, conducting choirs and orchestras, you couldn't, it, it was a risk, right? You could potentially get COVID from, you know, the droplets that were spreading out of people's mouths as they were singing. And so what I ended up doing was I ended up researching Web3, seeing what it was, was really inspired by it. Uh, released the first classical music NFT that sold for $375,000 to Metapurse in 2021. Uh, and in the process was recruited to help build out the music section of async art and also eventually you know got recruited to Met, uh, to to metaversal so i've always been really passionate about human connection and what web3 has done is it's been able to kind of combine all of these like very unexpected players in the same room and that has been really rewarding to be a part of and being at metaversal being able to provide vision and working uh, on that end of things has been really rewarding. So really happy to be here. That's awesome. So, okay. So tell me about Metaversal. Cause I feel like it's a, it's a multifaceted beast that does like, you know, investing, it does, you know, it's a co-production. Um, you guys are, are, are able to do a lot of really cool things. So, so like what is Metaversal? Metaversal is two primary things. Number one it is an investment vehicle. And number two, it is a venture studio. So in, in layman's terms, it invests in iconic N NFTs and it produces iconic NFTs. So we have a collection currently at Metaversal of over something like 2000 different NFTs. I think at this point, it's even more than that. And at the same time, we have a studio section, a venture studio section that takes IP that people come to us with or that we find or that we create and creates it into a Web3 product. So uh, Clubhouse Pictures, for example, Omega Runner is a piece of IP that we noticed on, very early on. Uh, we're extremely impressed with and inspired by. And so Metaversal is a joint venture partner of Clubhouse in the Omega Runner intellectual property. And we are helping launch the product 
from the marketing side, from the community management side, and the actual art build out and other elements. Awesome. Okay. So Bryce, can you take me through, I guess, initial ideation of a mega runner? Well, first of all, what is it? And how do you, how do you for- form that idea and kind of expand upon it? I, actually, I think I'll start with how we were thinking about it and then I'll pitch it to you. Cause I think it's more exciting in that direction. It actually started because, you know, we make, we make movies. So we did like bright with Will Smith for Netflix. We did I, Tanya, we did project power. We did birds of prey for DC and Warner Brothers, you know, The Watcher with Ryan Murphy, like we've done a lot of different projects. And the way all of those projects work is we're working with a studio who owns the IP 100%. We come in as sort of like a day player producer and we run the entire production system. But then at the end of the day, it's their piece of property. They keep it. And, you know, we go back to finding something new. And I think what we were talking about really early on, call it, you know, really like 2020 before we knew what NFTs were, so we were talking about like, okay, how do we create a property that we can own? And we were talking with a friend of ours who's the head of merchandising at Netflix. And it was like, okay, how do we create a property that we can own that also has this ability to go out into multiple different business channels? So it's not just a piece of content. It's a piece of content and a merchandising line, you know, action figures, toys, kids, pajamas, whatever it is, lunch boxes and video games, and comic books. And we were looking at things like Pokemon. We were looking at things like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, you know, obviously like Star Wars and Marvel and those properties that have this sort of, you know, like, yeah, they're comics or yeah, they're they're movies, but they're also this other thing, you know, very natively, um, just as essentially as they are the first thing. And I think we started talking about that and what that might look like. And we were coming up with this idea for a world in which racing is the basis of the political system. Because we were talking about vehicles and we were talking about having all these different countries and we were talking about this sort of fun, action-packed interpersonal conflict. Um, and we came up with this idea that is, you know, working with Cedric Nicholas Tryon, who's an incredible visualist and director, and plays Hemingway, who's a writer, has worked at every major animation house in the world, you know, Disney, Pixar, all over the place. And the idea is that the planet of Omega is just like ours, except pushed, you know, a thousand years into the future. And their culture is not based in a warrior culture, a conflict culture like ours. Conflicts on Omega are settled, settled through competition and speed. And so it's not about who's the strongest, but who's the fastest. And way back in the tribal days, this might be, you know, the head of two tribes meeting and racing across a field and whoever wins, wins this conflict. Now you take that and you blow it 30,000 years into the future and you have these high tech vehicles and these really, really like refined racing teams. And every single country on the planet of Omega, once every three years, sends one runner, they call the proxy runner, to pilot a vehicle in a t- multi-day, 21-day, and the winner of this Omega race gets to nominate the Omega Protector, which is basically the president of the world. So it's their massive kind of political election system is this big competition-based high-stakes racing. And we took this idea, and what we and, and what we love about it is it has these these different factions. It has this really kind of fun, inherent drama between all of the different characters because they come from these different countries. So they're always in competition with themselves. When one of your characters loses, another one always wins. And so you have this sort of like consistently happen simultaneously to that. You know, we'd watched the Beeple sale happen. I had, you know, jumped really early into, you know, trading NFTs on Nifty Gateway. I was like really early Board Ape Yacht Club. I was really early to some of those early projects. And I remember hanging out in some of these spaces and what everyone was talking about. They're like, oh my God, this is the future of IP right? This is going to go, you know, watching like Pixel Vault and stuff, create these comics. And it was like, okay, this is going to go be a television show. These people are going to go create the next Marvel. These people are going to go be the next Disney. You know, everybody kind of understood where it was going as a space. But as somebody whose day job is to assess IP and understand what can be global content and what maybe doesn't have, you know, all of the workings inside of it to go be, you know, big thing we're talking about, But if I were assessing this from my day job position, it's not quite there. But what I have is I do have something that is right there. And it's Omega Runner. What happens if we take Omega Runner, launch it inside of, you know, Web3? What happens if we launch it inside of this incredible new space with this really, like, amazing community, amazing marketing reach, amazing ability to kind of evolve and experiment really quickly? And what process, you know, create something that is community-based and community focused and also, 
you know, launch a new piece of IP that we haven't sold to the studio forever and have to walk away from when we're done. And at the same time, you know, create a new entertainment vertical. <laughs> like, how do we do all of this at one time? And it was really, Omega Run was pretty set up to be that. And I think the moment that really solidified it for all of us is we had this theme that we were talking And there's this one country called the Avalonian Union, and they've won every race for the last, you know, 300 years. Like, they win the races, and they use the power gleaned from winning the races to get themselves more power, so they win more races. And it's just like, they are that country inside of this world. And our story that we're telling to start out with focuses on two runners from the kind of bedraggled nation of Corrin. And Corrin, like, used to be a great nation, but they started losing races. And now they barely even have a racing team. However, there is this new technology. It's existed for a while, but it's been really unstable where you can basically like, we call them pinches, but you can see and navigate through wormholes in the middle of a race. And those wormholes might jump you 10 feet in the future. They might jump you 100 miles in the future. And, you know, most of the time you explode when you try this. So people don't do it because it's really dangerous. But one person in corn has developed a slightly different system that allows them to navigate these wormholes with a little bit more precision than anyone's done before. And maybe it's enough. Maybe this new piece of technology late in space was really the moment we were like, oh, we're in the right place. Like, this is the best way to tell this story because it feels like it's of the community that we're trying to tell it for. IP in general, like, first of all, did Omega Runner, did it come from a book or something? Or did you guys create this yourselves, like thinking about it and just kind of designing it yourself? Or is it from some book, comic, something like that? No, we created ourselves. It really, I mean, you know, everything kind of starts with an inspiration from somewhere else. And it was truly, it was, it was funny because it was a business proposal. We were looking at, um, we were talking to, again, a friend who's the head of merchandising and he was talking about cars, right? Like the cars franchise at Disney, Pixar, right? Prince, $3 billion a year in merchandising sales, what? right? Like they have made what $3 yeah, billion? No, outrageous. Yes, it is massive. That's so insane. the first movie did okay. At the box office, but it did huge numbers of merchandising. They've made seven sequels, I think. Most of them aren't theatrically re- released, but every time they make one, it does billions, billions in toy sales. And so that's something that's so interesting because in the movie business, so often people think of movies as the product, right? And it's like, what happens if the movie is not just the product? What if the product is the product? And the movie is just one facet of a massive piece of IP. So that's really where we started. We started talking about that. We were like, how do we create something, you know, like Pokemon again, where, you know, it starts as this game, but the game isn't really the only product. Like there are so many facets to that business. And we thought, okay, how do we design not just a single piece of content? How do we design a business? How do we design something larger? So that's when we started talking about cars. We started talking about like demolition derbies and crashing and like the fun action that you have there. We started talking about the conflicts of having different nations with different traits that people could kind of like identify with. It's like, oh, are you one of these people? Are you one of those people? You know, what does that look like? And it was really the sort of high level, how do we want people to engage with this property? And then once we had that kind of pinned down, we started talking to our writers and we started talking with our designers. And it was really Blaze who came in and said, hey, I've written, I've tried to write racing movies here before. The problem with racing movies is sometimes when you lose, that's all that happens. You just kind of pick yourself up and try again the next day. What happens if when you lose, there are geopolitical consequences? (laughs) And it really started there. And it started this like racing as a way of life with real stakes. And we started building it from that place. Again, it started because we're TV people, movie people. Like it started as a conversation, probably about an animated TV show. We've got, you know, what we might consider like season one kind of worked out what that looks like. But then pretty early on, we kind of made this, you know, we realized that we wanted to take it and pivot it into the Web3 space. We knew we wanted to talk about comic books. We knew that was going to be like a, a very early piece that we wanted to release because comics are, you know, fairly lightweight to produce something we could get out quickly and early and like really start to share with the community. Cause we wanted this story. Like we knew this world we created was huge and this world has so many different potential stories within it. And we thought, okay, let's have this one story that we're going to create first. And that's going to be the way we're going to hold people's hands on the way into our, into our universe. Right. It's the, like, there's so much to learn about star Wars, but if you don't have, you know, Luke's journey to kind of like show you, take you on a tour through the house, you would just get completely lost at what's inside. And so it's like, okay, how do we take 
one character or two characters? What do we show people? What is that story that we tell in the first place on the way into this world? What do we reveal about those worlds in the, in the process? And the best way to do that was like, okay, we can do that through comics pretty quickly and easily. And we've done that before we get into NFTs and then we'll do it through NFTs and then we'll do it, continue on through comics as we go and build television series, as we build merchandise, as we build, you know, these other elements. But I always kind of think of the, the NFT really, but also just like the, the IP in general as like the, the black hole at the center of this solar system around which all of these other properties orbit if that makes sense. So that's how we created this. This was a, you know, idea off the top of the dome that took a lot of different conversations and a lot of sort of, you know, strategic thinking to build. But we did it with truly some of the best creative minds in Brian Uncle, who's my boss, who's that, you know, the head of Clubhouse Pictures, really made his <laughs> he really made his career when he was like 26 years old, he pulled the Hunger Games off the shelf and said like, what if this were a movie? That would be a good idea. And that worked out really well for everyone involved. And then, you know, he's gone on from there he worked on all kinds of stuff from like Diary of a Wimpy Kid, Crazy Rich Asians, People versus O.J. Simpson, you know, like all of these projects that are, you know, it's like, how do you take a piece of story and position it not just to be the best version of itself, but the best version of itself in the movie world, in the TV world, like whatever it is. So we had him thinking about this from the business end. We brought in Blaze Hemingway, who has been a story fixer at Disney for years. Um, he was truly like, he's a production writer for, Wreck-It Ralph, Frozen, Zootopia, so many others in that line. Big Hero Six, I'm you know like a lot of a lot of really good work. Tron Legacy, he did the rewrites on, and then Cedric Nicholas Troyan, who's a world class, he was a world class visual effects supervisor. Um, actually, he's Academy Award nominated as a visual effects supervisor. Was an animator before that, and then he became a live action director. And we worked with him most recently on a live action movie called Kate which we did with Netflix and working with him on that process, we just realized we're like, Oh my God, this guy is maybe the best, best visualist we've ever worked with. Like you can show him a piece of art and he will give you the most precise, concise notes, you know, we've ever seen anywhere and it will just make the project consistently better. And I think working with that level of talent, sitting down and saying, okay, if you had to create a TV show, if you had to create an NFT, if you had to go build something that was meant to be what I could talk about as like global franchise content, what does it look like? It was really fun. It was a really cool process. That's so cool. Okay. So I want to go touch upon cars really fast. You said they make $3 billion per year. What are they making money from? Is it like t-shirts? Is it like cars or something like that? Like, like, and also just traditionally, how do, how does like Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, how do they actually monetize their, their brands? So those are really successful examples, for instance, because obviously you have like Harry Potter, you've got the book, which is doing crazy numbers, but then you have the movies and inside the movies you have the merchandising. So you have wands and toys and Lego sets and, you know, card games, you have Halloween costumes, like there are so many different things that it can be your answer to cars. I don't know precisely what the breakdown is, but it's a lot of plastic cars. I can tell you that it's also you like, you know, like lunch boxes and theme parks and little toys, like plushies, whatever you can think of, they produce it for that franchise. And it's just, you find something that connects properly. It's the reason, for instance, that like every new Star Wars movie has something cute, right? Like the reason BB-8 exists, they invented it because it was a cool, cute looking droid that they could sell toys for, right? <laughs> and it serves a story purpose, but it like they probably put more notes into the design of that element than they put into who their lead actor was, which is like a wild idea, but it was probably the case. You know, you look at like the Mandalorian, like that little baby Yoda, like you can like that thing is designed to be merchandising crack. And that's not to say that you can do it at the expense of the creative, like the creative still has to be good. The creative has to be good for something like that to work, but it is a very intentional business decision and something that, you know, I think we, we wanted to do when we were building this product because I thought, you know, well, that sounds fun. So are, are most IP, like, or I guess, yeah, are most movies and TV shows, are they monetized through physical goods? Is that the vast majority of, of no. revenue? That is the majority of the Disney model. Um, and the Disney model is very different from most of Hollywood. So most movies that are made, you know, the, the viewing the movie is the business. Um, certainly, you know, through streamers, things like Netflix, right? It's like the subscription is the business. You are paying for the thing that they are selling. But there is this entire other side of... <laughs> the film industry um, that really can't be discounted. It goes beyond box office, which is what 
can you launch that exists beyond a single piece of content, right? Beyond a single movie. And some things, you know, like when we made Birds of Prey, for instance, you know when you're going into designing Harley Quinn and her costume, like you know that's going to be a costume that people are going to be wearing to fan conventions, that people are going to be wearing as Halloween costumes, right? Like you have that in your mind as you're building it. You're actually working with, you know, for instance, their toy designers at the same time so that they have all of the updated, like, hey, guys, this is what we're doing with the coat. You got to make sure you make that change inside of your action figure. Like you're having those conversations while you're going into production. And so there's there's some idea behind things like that because they know that that fan base is going to show up and they're going to want the minifig and they're going to want the Funko Pop or, you know, whatever it is. But for the most part, those conversations happen after properties are successful. So a, you know, a brand new movie, a piece of new IP is going to go out into the world just as a movie. And if it succeeds, you're going to start seeing products about that movie 12 months, 18 months later, because that's the kind of lead time you need to be able to make, you know, tie in t-shirts and goods and whatever else. And the, the, the sad thing about that model is because you pretty much always miss your sort of like cultural moment with the marketing materials um, by the time you get merchandise into shelves. So like the first movie will come out and do well, but you won't actually see a massive merchandising per like push on any sort of IP project until the second movie comes out. It's like, it's a sequel thing because they know the sequel is going to do okay. So they start putting that stuff into production months before the movie even goes into production sometimes, which is just like, that's, this is a little inside baseball about like how the timelines of these things work, but that is really what sets Disney apart from so many other studios is that Disney knows usually far in advance. They're like, okay, this one is going to work and we are going to make products for X, Y, Z so that they are ready. They are in shelves the day of release of this movie. Wow. Okay. So, so I guess, I guess Disney, they monetize meaning through products, most other uh, movies, TV shows, et cetera. They monetize through through the actual show or, or movie. Is that is that is that yeah. the rough kind of breakdown? Well, at first, I would say like look at Stranger Things, right? I think it took Netflix three seasons to get Stranger Things merchandise into the world because they didn't have a merchandising department when that show hit, and they probably lost out on a lot of potential what I would call lunchbox money by not selling you know those you know those like fun collectible fan based stuff now. Five seasons in, they have everything. It all exists. But they did probably miss out on two years of real cultural dominance where they could have made a lot selling products. So what you see is you don't see it that it doesn't happen. You just see the sort of lag time that prevents, especially in the movie world, it prevents you from going into merchandising with your initial um, release, which is always too bad because it's such a viable path for so many products that... I think there's a lot of shows that people would look at and be like, Hey, I loved that. Why does this not get a second season? It's like, well, it only did okay. And it didn't have the merchandising to supplement it. And so it only ever did okay. And so nobody's going to, you know, they're not going to fund season two. Interesting. Okay. So, all right. Uh, going back to Omega runner. So if you're walking down the street, you see your buddy and you're like, Hey, I'm working on this new thing. Here's what it is. How do you explain it to someone? Like, do you, do you, do you include that there's web three involved? You're like, no, no, I'm not going to mention that. Just like, it's this great IP and here's what it does. Of course, mention Web3. I think I talk about Web3 in the same way that people talk about, you know, as like a proving ground for IP. In the same way people talk about comics, in the same way people talk about podcasts or like what I would call low lift productions, right? Things that are like slightly easier than a $50 million movie or a, you know, $500 million AAA game. Like, like how do you start with something that instead of taking three years to produce takes you know, one year or six months or something? How do you start um, small and trying to find the right audience and sort of figure out exactly what you are um, so that you can use that leverage and use that fan base to really launch yourself into those larger pools? So with, for instance, a successful podcast, you can go get a TV show deal, right? You can go get a movie deal. We actually spend a lot of time as a company looking at, you know, current podcasts, looking at current like up and coming comic books, books, that type of product and say, oh, hey, this not only has a great creative idea, but it has, you know, this, this small fan base behind it. And then if we can take that, we can go to the studios and say, hey, guys, check this out, check out this piece of material. It's not just, 
a great idea. It's a great idea. And this fan base that is like full of people that really love it. And if you can find a way, if you can figure out why these people really love it and convince 10 million more people to really love it, you'll have a global franchise on your hands. And so it's that like, it's that little initial launch that's super, super powerful in the IP game. And when I talk about Web3, I think we talk about it as, you know, of course, we want it to succeed as a Web3 product, but we all know that the Web3 pond is actually quite small on a global scale. So the, the Web3 pond is really something we prove, we, we see as like a proving ground and, a, a, you know, a Petri dish for good ideas. I, I view Web3 specifically around IP as just like the ultimate monetization tool. Like if I read a cool story mm-hmm. and uh, it's from, you know, I don't know, some author in Kenya and, you know, the author releases official collectibles, uh, you know, if I were normally to buy those and they were physical goods, let's say, that would be a huge pain. Like I have to like, I don't know, wire money to Kenya and like who, like, who knows, right? Um, but as NFTs, it's like, oh, cool, I can buy the official collectible immediately right now. And it, the shipping cost is zero because it's, you know, like uh, direct to my wallet. Um, that's how I view it. Do you view Web3 in other ways other than kind of the uh, monetization uh, aspect and or the collectability slash incentivization of holders because they're like, oh, cool, I want to buy this collectible because maybe it'll go up in value. Like, who who knows, right? Yeah, and I mean, the the speculation part of the world is always going to be there in NFTs. I think there's certainly, you know, most people are going to engage just by buying and holding. And they're going to be fans and they're going to be part of it. And they like having the holding that makes them, you know, part of a community it kind of defines the boundary of who's really involved with something versus who's just sort of watching it from the outside. And that's great. We're super into that. I think if you go one layer deeper, we are sharing elements of the IP with holders um, and allowing them to go use those things and create things using that IP. And I think that for me is really the place where Web3 stands apart from anything else that has ever existed anywhere. Because I could talk nitty gritty IP law for a very long time, but basically the way I P law is set up, especially in the United States, is it really doesn't recognize something like collaboration. And it really doesn't recognize something like shared or distributed rights. And one of the things that we saw, and you know, something that was so powerful watching, you know, board apes explode the way they did, was watching what just a, a very basic IP license can do for a group of people. You know, whether you're looking at like beverage companies that are launching or, you know, people being using their apes inside of music videos or just like t-shirts and stickers and other types of collectibles. Suddenly you had thousands of people that realized they were holding a brand with a piece of IP that they could actually go out into the world and monetize themselves. And what you do is you basically deputize thousands and thousands of people to be your marketing partners. So now instead of building a piece of IP yourself, trying to convince other people to buy it, You've convinced thousands of people to help you to go collectively create something that is bigger than any of you could create by yourselves. And I think that is really the key to like the Yuga success when we look at it. And that was a real deep inspiration for me. Um, because one thing that's always sort of bugged me about IP and how it works in this world is, or in, in our world, is that, you know, the IP lives with the author. And there's a lot of defending like the author rights or the owner's rights, whatever that is. But if you go onto the internet, if you spent any real time on the internet, you'll see that there's this incredible creative community that's constantly interfacing with pieces of IP that they don't own. So whether it's Harry Potter fan fiction or Star Wars fan fiction or fan art about Marvel characters, you know, it's like people drawing these incredible landscapes where it's like, what happens if I drop Captain America into the middle of Wakanda? Like what goes down? And you're seeing these storylines be created that don't ever get created by the official creators but you're watching this creativity happen online in real time and obviously that provides value back to the original ip like people engaging with it that way and creating their own things and remixing their own things provides value back to the original ip so something that you can do in web3 that's so exciting is you can allow people to hold the token and go do that kind of thing and actually get that value themselves And that's so cool as a business model because they're getting the value themselves and you're getting the value because it's helping your IP. And it's just this like awesome sort of collective win-win situation. So for me, that was a huge piece of the inspiration for like, how do we take this and do it really differently? So it's not just like, 
you know, we're not just using Web3 as a springboard. It's like, how do you use Web3 to do something differently that people have never done before so that it really justifies itself as like, this is why we're launching inside of this medium. It's really cool. So this is a really bad analogy, but I'm going to say it anyways. It's kind of like uh, YouTube in the sense where um, YouTube is a platform and I, I, as a fan, I'm going to you know create videos and host them on YouTube and that adds value to YouTube, but also I can maybe participate in some upside if my videos are popular. Um, you know, I'll get ad revenue. So I guess it's like kind of like that. It's a, kind, of, kind of a bad analogy, but um, yeah, it's very no, cool. it's, it's exactly right, like, so. It's, like, it's sort of meme culture too, right? Or um, any sort yeah. of thing that was created by a bunch of people on the internet. I look at like one of the things that I love is I have an image of um, you know Reddit R place, which is like that giant pixel canvas they created where you can place one pixel every five minutes. Um, it was sort of replicated by the bathroom in early BAYC days. Um, where you could go and place a single pixel every, you know, 30 seconds or something. So you can create art, but you really can't do it unless you've like worked with a lot of people towards a shared goal. And I think there's like things like that that are created by the internet. And if you wanted to talk about AI, we could go there too. But like, how do you use new technology to create new product? And what does that look like? Because like, you know, borders and laws and all of these things that tr like govern traditional IP usage really go out the window when you start thinking about it in a practical sense. And Web3 is the first thing that I've seen that really has the tools to address how that could work. Um, and that's what's so interesting about it. Wow, okay. Um, yeah, no, we're, we're definitely gonna dig deep and I into AI and content generation very, very soon. But Sam, I, I wanna ask you, what are your thoughts around the power and potential of, of Web3 pertaining to IP, um, you know, and I, I know Bryce just touched upon a few things, but is there anything else that, that we missed that is just really important that, that we're not talking about? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, let's just dive into these, this idea that Bryce mentioned of, of democratizing uh, story, this idea of media three um, at the heart of every piece of uh, successful project, right? There is a really compelling story. And what we've seen traditionally is the fact that these stories are created uh, without the audience. They're created for the audience. The audience gets to, gets to see and they get to decide whether they like it. What we are doing with Omega Runner is we are actually, we have the story. We have like this notion of where the story is going to go. But there are still elements that get to be defined by the community as we go along with it. And so that gives us new avenues to be able to explore things like, um, you know, an animated series, gaming in the future. Um, we've we've particularly imbued our, our character collection with uh, omni-chain technology. Um we set up the basis, the skeleton, the bones of these things, and then we have a direction, but we allow our community to sort of define bits and pieces of it as we go. And I think that that is another thing that I see because I, you know, had I had a hand in deciding the fate of Star Wars or Darth Vader, it would have been very different than the actual movie, right? And so, like, what I get to do and, and what we all get to do with Bryce and Clubhouse and, and Metaversal is, is we actually get to give uh, a little bit more democratization in that process. And that's how we define this idea of media three, which we're very excited about. So, so building off that, are you talking about like, um, you know, I can choose if my car is red or blue, or is it like, no, no, I can choose if like this character crashes and is like, you know, done for. Weirdly, I think, Something that I did really early on, because um, there's, you know, there's been a number of projects, I think, that have gone sort of this, like, we're not the first group into this idea of, like, what if we use, you know, Web3 as an IP generation tool? Um, and something that you see a lot of projects do is they'll have, like, you know, a six-character cast or something. And then every single one of your NFTs is one of those six characters. And so you're just owning one of a thousand versions of this character within this collection. And I think we looked at that and we said like, Oh, that's a little, that's a little unfun. There's also, there's like legal reasons why that would get messy when you're talking about IP rights sharing. But we said, okay, what happens if we create 10,000 unique individuals that all inhabit this planet? And we have, you know, we have our characters that we call the core collection that are like, you know, our main eight characters of the storyline that we are telling right now. 
Now, the characters that people will get within the collection are characters that will be just theirs to define what they do with that exist within the same world. So, for instance, like, you know, to use the Star Wars analogy, like, okay, we're telling the Luke and Leia story, but you might have different droids or different Wookiees or different Jedi, you know, within your collection that you can take and kind of do what you want with. Now, is there an opportunity for those to come back into the main storyline later? Yeah, I think so. Um, is there an opportunity for you to just take them off on your own and do your own thing if you want to? Yeah, I think that's also like super, super cool. And for me, that's the most fruitful way to do something like this that's like wildly large and decentralized. Because if you try to do um, the other version of IP sharing that people have done, which is like, what happens if every single one of our holders has a vote on what happens, you know, with our main storyline, for instance, I think you run into this really messy place where it's sort of this like big authorless sort of chain of events that doesn't really work. Like, ultimately, when we're talking creative and story, like it's good to have a couple of different eyeballs on something because you'll see things you didn't see the first time. But there is such a thing as too many cooks. One of the things I did really early on in the pandemic, actually, is I created a Reddit. I created a subreddit attempting to write a screenplay just using Reddit upvotes. And so it was like, okay, everybody, you know, day one blank page, like, what's our genre? Where are we starting? And people would just vote for whatever their favorite one was. And you start nailing down further and further. And you start getting like, okay, here's act one. Here's act two. Here's act three. Okay. So first scene in act one, what does it look like? Let's start nailing it down. And people would throw up suggestions. And it worked really, really well for the first month or so. But then after it started getting too granular, what would happen is I would post a question for like, what does the next scene look like? And I would have 30 submissions and each submission would have one vote. And the issue was that you had all these people participating, but they all wanted to see their version become the official version. And it kind of leads to this creative deadlock. And so what's interesting about the way we're working now is rather than taking a lot of inputs on a single story, we're letting a lot of people run their own stories that can kind of all exist within the same world and fandom. And I think um, in that situation, the stuff that's really good that connects with people will rise to the top and will become, you know, quote unquote, like official canon or that sort of thing. And the stuff that people don't connect with as much, you know, it won't. And that's really how the internet works to filter content and you know, find great content. And that's, you know, more the mechanism that we're looking to use. So, so me, me as a, as a, you know, viewer, reader, et cetera, watcher, whatever, um, I can make my own storyline and it could potentially be put into the main Omega runner storyline. We would have to work out a deal, but yeah, I think so. Or it could be as simple as, I don't know why I just thought of this, but you remember those Game of Thrones PFPs and that really like ugly one with the hands that like extended? Yeah. Like imagine seeing that character on act- on an episode of Game of Thrones um, and recognizing it, you know, like this could be one of those things where an Easter egg, for example, could be in, in a future comic book, one person's PFP could just like appear in the background or so small, small like bits and pieces like that, that generate lots of excitement and like, well, when, when is my PFP going to happen? When That's is really my cool. PFP going to be in a, in a comic book? Very cool. So, so yeah, it's almost like, um, Oh sweet. You know, episode five, my PFP was briefly featured in the back. Like that's so cool. And then maybe, um, you know, I, I, I could like write a note about my, P, you know, Hey, Omega runner five, nine, four was like featured, blah, blah, blah. That's yeah, really, exactly. Really cool. That's awesome. That's precisely it. All right. So, so Sam, I, I want to ask about Metaversal's role in Omega Runner. Um, how did you guys, I, I guess, how did you guys find Bryce and the, you know, the, the, the whole team and what was your kind of conversation with them? You know, obviously you don't, you don't tell me all the details, but like, I'd love to hear like, you know, how, how did that happen? Like, Hey guys, uh, you guys are really smart. You guys are into web three. You guys are very creative, like team up with us and we're going to build this, you know, X, Y, Z. Um, you know, thing. And then at what point were you like, okay, I want to actually uh, join this squad as well. I, I want to join Omega Runner to be fully a part of this. Like, I want to hear that whole whole thing. Well, let's travel back in time for a second uh, to like 2021, the end of 2021. Like it was like November 2021, I believe. I was at Art Basel actually. And it was NFT NYC. Yeah, there you go. There you go. So I remember uh, we got introduced to the clubhouse team in, you know, through one of our investors. And there were several meetings that happened over the course. They sent us a pitch deck. 
Um, I remember one one of our teammates and I were looking over that pitch deck, trying to decide because we we had you know like 50, 60 different projects that we were considering. And this one came across the desk, and we started flipping through it. We started seeing some of the concepts and some of the explanations of what the Omega Runner universe is, and the story uh, was really compelling. It was something that that stood out from the beginning, not just because not just because of the elements in the story, but it was also because the clubhouse team put, it, it was very evident that the clubhouse team had put so much effort and thought into it that we had not seen in other projects, like hands down. It was one of the most thought through proposals that we had ever had. And it was filled with so much detail in both the visuals and the actual explanation of stuff that it was something that we, we we were very interested in. And so when we got on a meeting, I remember, I specifically remember the first meeting with Cedric when he's talking about the Omega world uh, and, and talking about his inspirations, Blade Runner, Apex Legends, like all these things that I had, I, I had been a part of and I had seen in the past. Uh, Yossi, myself, and several other team members looked at this and were like, we have to do this. So... What we ended up doing in the very beginning was we ended up figuring out, uh, so this was also very distinctive, let me just say, from the very beginning, because Bryce uh, is a Web3 native, right? So he has, he participated in, in Board Apes, he's been a part of the space, he understood the space very well. This was something that was also unique and actually made our job very unique in a sense because we were able to just like move on to the next level rather than starting from ground zero and building from there, which was great. We started by visioning what could potentially happen. Like what are the different angles, the branches of what could, could do in the Omega world? And no idea was, was off the table. Um, we thought it, that's how we eventually landed on to Omnichain technology. That's how we eventually landed on to animated series, movies, things like this, and the comic books that are already out there. And what Metaversal has been doing as a joint venture partner, it has been supporting Clubhouse in uh, marketing efforts, in community management, in th these different areas that are very essential. A lot of projects that come from the outside, as you know, Andrew, get a lot of flack. They get a lot of criticism right off the bat because people say, well, you're not part of the space. You're not part uh, you, you're not you're not someone that is native to what we're trying to do, and therefore, like we reject you because you, just by virtue of that. And what we were able to do was say, hold on, like we are a team here together uh, of Web three natives uh, with backgrounds that have that are very relevant to what we're trying to do, and this is we're actually here not as a cash grab, not as a rug pull, but as something that we feel passionately and strongly about bringing into the space. And it has worked. Uh, you know, we just had a Twitter space last week with over 500 people. Um, we've had so like a lot of engagement on our videos and content. And I think people see, see that there's something here in terms of like the fundamental being this really strong storyline, like the team behind it, that it is something that's here to stay and something that's building from the ground up uh, very honestly and earnestly in the space. And I think like, just to, to wrap this all up in a bow, Metaversal's primary role is to make sure that we are supporting Clubhouse's ideas with a solid framework and a solid you know, uh, presence in the space. I love it, love it. Yeah. So, okay. So you mentioned the, the community. I'd love to hear more about that. Are, are the people that are intrigued by Omega Runner, are they mostly Web3 natives that, you know, love the style of the NFT and they think it's cool and they like the storyline? Or are these more like people that are really into, you know, sci-fi and are like, man, this story is so cool. NFTs are cool, whatever. I'm more interested in like the storyline. Like what is, how does it look like today and go, evolving in the future? Where do you think the bulk of, of new, um, fans will come from. Yeah, man. I got to tell you, our community is awesome. Like the people that are in the discord right now are, are like so passionate about this, about the story. And what, I, what's actually happening right now is that people, people ha are like coming in and they're asking like, where, like, what is this new 
story. Like, where can I find more information? Like, I've seen stuff on Twitter. And then we'll point them in the direction of the comic book and they'll read the first issue. They're like, oh, my God. How do I find more? And then they start taking on these, like, personalities of the different nations. Some people are like, oh, I'm from Quarren. I'm going to beat the Avalonian Union. Other people are like, I'm the Avalonian Union. You're never going to be able to defeat me ever again. And that is such a rewarding thing. Because it starts with this, but I know that eventually what's going to happen is people are going to start creating fan fiction. They're going to start creating like additional art and so on and so forth. So I think the type of audiences that we have are really interesting. They're, they're kind of a mixed bag. Some of them are, you know, of course, DGENs, people that are very excited about getting on the allow list and so on and so forth. Um, but I also think that there are other people that are genuinely sci-fi nerds that, that really are interested, uh, honestly and earnestly, in a really good story. When we had the first edition comic book, most of the people that came in were actually people that got into NFTs as a result of the story. And now we're seeing this mixture of the two, which is so exciting because that is that is a recipe for in my opinion, that is a recipe for success. You need both areas. You need uh, people that are going to be able to promote the project and believe in it, believe in the value of it. But you also need the people that are going to like spread it far and wide in order you know, to find more value um, and, and to spread the word as much as possible. So I think that you know, our community is at this like baby stage that is like growing by five to eight years every day. And I'm really excited to see where it goes um, because there's a lot of, a lot of like energy in the discord and on the Twitter and on my personal Twitter as well. And I'm sure on prices. Yeah. And I think one of the things that's really exciting and something we thought about really early when we were looking at these communities, we're like, okay, you know, a successful NFT project might have, 3,500 holders, right? And in our world, you know, if you don't have half a million viewers a week for a TV show, like you get canceled. Absolutely. Right. You're looking at 500,000. So it's like, okay, how do you cross that gap? Because you're not going to sell, you're not going to have 500,000 holders when you have a 10,000 K or a 10 K collection. So is there a world, how do you appeal to people that don't hold this? Like, can you create something that is good enough that it is just legitimately a good piece of content so that the people who just want to be in it for the content and consume it the way a normal consumer would consume content will become fans of the project. And so it's like, okay, we're going to cater to the NFT community right now. There are people in it that are just in it for the DGen side of it. They're in it for this like new, brave new world of the internet that we're creating. Like there's some really cool stuff happening there. Then the idea is to, you know, find just enough fandom, find just enough people that we can go and take it and launch it in the world of, you know, a Netflix or an Amazon or one of those big places, create a piece of content that people can just engage with the same way that they engage with, you know, Family Guy or any of these other cartoons or anime. And then, you know, from the people that engage there, if 1%, 2%, 3% come back to the NFT and say, this is where it started. Wow, this is what it, you know, this is where it came from. You start to have this sort of self-supporting cycle where the NFT supports the television show, the television show supports the NFT, and then you see how this business really creates and evolves. And so for us, it's like, we want all of those fans. We want the people that are really in it that know everything about blockchain that are like deep inside of this IP structure that we're building. And then we want the people that are just like, dude, neat. I think that's something that you'll see if, if you start looking at other NFT projects and like, I don't want to talk shit because like everybody's making it up. Like it's brave new world for everyone, but there's a lot of people that have created something that's really excited for the people that hold it. But if you're not holding it, it's like maybe not enough for you to want to engage with. And I think that's a real weak point for, you know, the entire industry kind of has to deal with that fact. It's like, Hey, if you're not competing with other Saturday morning cartoons, how are you going to compete? Like, how are you actually going to have what we talk about, like onboarding Web3 users and onboarding new people? Like, how are you going to do that if you can't compete with these pieces of entertainment that are currently available? And so for us, it's like, yes, we are going to do both. Okay. So what is the, we'll call it like, I don't know, five, 10 year vision for a mega runner. Like where, where do you guys want to be? What do you guys want to be doing in, in, you know, in, in the you know, far and slash near future? Yeah, I mean, I always talk about a cereal box. Like, I'll know we've made it when we're invited onto a cereal box. I think short term, you know, certainly like a TV series is something that's, you know, really in our brain. Um, continuing the comic series, just like really launching this from the IP place where it is. 
Some of it depends on, you know, what the appetite is as we go through launch, how we, you know, there's, there's the super fast track version and then there's the slightly slower version. I think racing obviously has like really clear parallels to how it would work in gaming. I think there's a, a real opportunity for us there. And, and then particularly NFT gaming, where we're talking about perhaps, you know, what does your racing rig look like? What kind of traits does it have? What kind of things can you add to it or subtract from it? And can you build yourself a car? Like, I think those opportunities are really, really exciting and fit really nicely into this world that we've built. And for me, those are kind of the, the, main, the main buckets. Tim? Yeah, just to, you know... Just to add, I, I mentioned this before. I think you know, high level at the center of every great project is really strong storytelling IP. That's what we need to focus on, and that's what we have to prioritize. And from there, obviously, you know, there. You, let's just state state the obvious. You know, Hollywood NFTs, they all exist. Um, the, the, it is a trend in the space. Clanosaurs is one. Huxley is another one. They do a really wonderful job in, in their own respective fields. So I think that that is something that is, is already established. So obviously, you know, what Bryce said makes total sense, like an animated series, you know, these types of things. Um, but even beyond that scope, gaming, games, I wake up every morning and I think about, you know, when I think about being, uh, you know, part of the nation of Quarren, which I am, I think about like what that looks like. And I immediately think in my head something along the lines of like that old Star Wars pod racing game, you know, focusing on the gaming aspect is something that is really interesting to us. And then finally, you know, as I've mentioned before, you know, we've imbued our NFTs with omni-chain technology. So, our NFTs are going to travel blockchains. They're going to be able to interact in different ways on different blockchains. And that eventually is going to look like different geographic locations. And so from that perspective, we have this amazing universe that is going to be able to be interacted and be able to kind of be lived in, in several different capacities. You can live in it through content, through watching it with your eyes, through interacting with it with your hands and through experiencing it with your, you know, like virtual headset. And that is the five to 10 year vision. But those are the three specific ways that we're, that we're focusing on over the next um, several months. All right. So I want to talk about AI, obviously, because, you know, it, it's, it's the hot thing. It's been the hot thing for the past like, year um, and specifically around um, AI or on content generation. It's like, you know, creating content, whether it be like, images, uh, text, uh, video, whatever. Traditionally, that's been like the most expensive thing in content generation is, is, is that, that production aspect. Um, and Bryce, I, I love, you know, for you to correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like we've just brought down the costs. Of course, the quality is not, not, not that level yet, but we brought down the cost of content generation by like orders of magnitude. We'll call it like a hundred X. Right. And, uh, in that world, uh, not only are you, you guys perfectly primed to, you know, thrive and excel because suddenly you can, do so much more with so, so much less, but what are the other ramifications? So I guess like, how are you guys looking at AI around content generation or really around like whatever for Omega Runner? And then broadly, like, what does that mean for, I guess, the future of media entertainment? You know, within Omega Runner, I, you know, I've played with a lot of image generation, for instance, and my experience with AI, it's, it's funny because, you know, so much of this, of how we built Omega Runner, for instance, is we took this ideation and we went to uh, a studio called Sun Creature, which is this incredible animation concept house. And we kind of said, hey, it needs to look a little bit like this, a little bit like that. We gave them some reference images. We gave them some ideas of what we are looking for. And then we go through this iterative process where they come back to us with this, like, you know, is a 25 person team in their art department coming back with these incredible sort of like concepts for what the world looks like and what these characters look like. And that's how we built this project out. Trying to do the same thing with AI gives you back really mediocre results is sort of my experience so far. It's like you can create things that are really, really cool if you don't have something specific that you're looking for. But if you're trying to create something new that doesn't quite exist right now, it kind of just fails. And so I think when you talk about AI image generation, it's like if you're looking for something that's kind of a mashup of 
two things that currently exist, it does really well. If you're looking for something that, you know, if you're trying to use it as sort of like a Google image search, like you're just looking for the clip art version of XYZ, like it can do pretty well. But if you're looking for something new and specific and creative, my finding is that it's really lackluster. Now that'll change, but I haven't been super impressed with it. Uh, I've done the same thing using like chat GPT, trying to like have it pitch me stuff. Like I've tried to like, you know, pitch me Romeo and Juliet in space, pitch me this, like, what does it look like? What does it look like? And you end up getting these like weirdly circular story structures that don't like, it's almost like hearing a bad pitch from like a really, really inexperienced writer where they'll tell you like, oh my God, it's going to be great. It's going to change the world. It's going to be all about love and romance, but they don't actually tell you like, you know, one day Romeo goes to the market and he meets this girl, right? It's like X, Y, Z happens because this happens because that happens. And it actually lacks some sort of like the real foundational moments of story structure. And I think, you know, we will see that change. And there's a fight going on right now in the the writer's guild actually is talking about striking for other reasons too. But part of the contract negotiation is how do you treat AI inside of the world of the writer's guild? It's like, because when you feed, you know, you could go and feed Hollywood script libraries, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, thousands of scripts into an AI system and say, give me the storyline of a giant shark movie. And, and, you know, what happens and what does it spit out? And then can you take that and use that as the basis of a, of a production? Or are you stealing from the writers that you fed into this machine? Right? How, like, what are they owed within that process? Um, I think more likely what you'll see because at least short term right now, you're going to run into the same problem, which is that you're going to get something really generic out of it. And what makes things good is that specificity and that inventiveness and that new stuff. So I think right now, what you'll see AI do that's actually exciting is you'll see a writer sit down and maybe have AI throw ideas back. Use is really, really interesting and really, really fruitful. But I think having somebody who doesn't know what they're doing, just turn around and say like, hey, I please write me a great American novel. Like you're not going to end up with anything useful, at least in the next five, 10 years. I will say though, I, I did go to East Denver this year. Andrew, I don't know if you had a chance to go, but when I was at East Denver, um, uh, this is a shout out to Coin Artist and Blockade Games, but I did see what they're working on. And a lot of what they're working on is video game generation through AI. It's insane. It's insane what they're able to generate in a matter of like minutes and hours, like full, full fledged games that are able to be played immediately in their worlds, in their respective worlds, um, completely. I, I do agree with Bryce. Like the, the technology is still pretty nascent, even though it is very advanced for what it's trying to do. It doesn't reach the nooks and crannies that, you know, traditional like human made art and human made creative content is used to and, and what, what, what is able to be made. But I have no doubt that it's going to get there. And it's a little terrifying to think about what happens when it does get there. Cause at that point, everyone will be able to make a game. Everyone will be able to make an animated series and everything in between. But it is a really, it is very exciting to see this technology and how exponentially it's growing just in a matter of like months, right? Like GPT-4 is out and it's it's yeah. an enormous improvement from the previous one. And it only took like, what, Six like months. a year, a year Maybe. and a half, something like yeah. that? So yeah, it's very exciting. I said six months. Like I think it was faster from GPT-3 to GPT-4. I think it was like, it was not very fast, very long. Um, Mid-Journey, I started playing with Mid-Journey in version and now we're on version five and it's jaw dropping. I mean, the quality of the quality of the image that it creates is really good. The idea behind the image is still often you mentioned the timeline, you're like five, ten years not gonna have a big impact. I'm like, I think it's gonna have a big impact like you know, the next two years, right? I think it's I think it's like coming very quickly. I think you will need the human expert and curator and, and you know, kind of that brain, the human brain behind it. Uh, like almost always potentially. Um, but in terms of like being able to make really cool high fidelity Omega runner, like images, whether it be the cars or whether it be the, the people, whatever, I think that's, I feel like that's coming soon, you know, ne next year or two. I, I think, especially if we could feed the, feed the art that we've already created into it. Right. Then it's like, Hey, can you take this vehicle, put this vehicle into this situation or that situation? I think that's where it becomes a really, really powerful tool. 
with a little bit of like handcrafted setup. Um, I think the like just generating out the top of your head without the reference material still is like a really, really tough place to be. But I think the the more rote functions where you like feed in a 3D model of your character and then say, you know, do a sequence where this character is running down a hallway on a spaceship dodging, you know, alien slime or something like that is more like far more possible. Okay. So what do you think about, you know, uh, Sam, you mentioned this, you're like, yeah, you know, this technology is getting really good pretty quickly. Uh, soon a lot of people are going to have this in that world where, you know, yeah. And Bryce, to your point, like I, I can't make something instantaneously. I can feed it some bits of information that, that I created myself, whether it be images, text, video, whatever, and they can kind of build off that. But yeah, Sam, if, if everyone has access to this, let's just say, I don't know, GPT six or whatever, right. Um, you know, what is that? What does the world look like in terms of like who who wins? How how do you have an advantage? Do you, do you just have to tell like the best, most juicy, most incredible story ever, or like how, how you know how, how do you who who wins? Yeah, I mean it's a great question. I think you know when we think about traditional art, I think the future the winners are going to be the best wordsmiths, and that's so strange to think about because the best artists are going to be the ones that can craft a sentence well enough to be able to hold all the details that they're looking for in a piece of art in their vision. And I think, you know, when you, when you expand from that, that's, I think where the winners are going to be in the film and entertainment industry. I mean, I think, you know, you can reproduce, you can feed things into GPT, let's say six, whatever the case may be, and you can create a game, but an AI cannot recreate community. It can't recreate this idea of communal storytelling and story making. It can create all of the technical elements. It could create the game. It could create the audio tracks for it. It could create the art and the PFPs that are going to be done. But ultimately, the vision behind it, the the communal like sort of collaboration behind it, is still deeply rooted in humanity and in, and in individuals yeah. coming together and doing that. And I think as we continue, you know, I, I make this argument for music all the time that AI is actually going to replace, and it is already replacing DJs and pop musicians. People are going to start, are going to start wanting to go more towards the, the genres that have, that require human connection. So genre like niche genres, like jazz and classical music, potentially in the future, is going to be the same thing in, in film and entertainment. People are always going to gravitate towards human created content, even if it is supported by AI. And that's what deeply grounds me to this idea of like that Omega runner will has this five to 10 year vision and an endless existence because it will always be rooted in the human connection of things. And that is something that's like, that I have strong conviction on. Amazing. Awesome. All right, guys, I, I know we went a bit over time here, but are you ready for some closing questions? Let's go. Of course. All righty. Let's go with uh, Sam first. Sam, what are you bearish on? I'm bearish on music NFTs right now. Really? Tell me why. I don't think it's the time for music NFTs yet. I think that there's so much potential that they have but 80% of the industry is controlled by like three entities. And so long as those entities do not come into the space, it's going to be really hard for music to do anything other than audiovisual work, like audiovisual collaboration, which I think still will, will continue to be successful. All right, Bryce, what are you bearish on? That's such an interesting question. I want to say like, I want to say NFT collections that are pumping for no reason. Like I think the thing that we've seen, the best thing of the bear market, right, is that you start watching the real kind of fluffy projects fail. And you start to see the people that stick around are the ones that have a purpose beyond just the crazy high valuations. And I think hard to watch in some ways, but also probably good for the space long term. And we've seen a lot of innovation and a lot of sort of experimentation through the bear market that's really, really exciting. And I think sets us up long term for better success. That said, it also seems like the collections that are making the biggest headlines are still the ones where it's like, wait, what's here? What's behind this? Like, is there, is, is there any, is there any meat on this bone or is it all just like, you know, smoke and mirrors? And I think those projects, people are getting tired and will fade away. 
Awesome. All right, Bryce, what are you bullish on? It can't be Omega Runner or uh, Metaversal. You know, I, I think I'm bullish on the people that are creating because they truly love the experience of interacting with NFTs. Um, and they love the community that they interact with using NFTs. Um, some of the most fun that I've ever had on the internet has been through the NFT space and just when events happen. I mean, even like there, there are weird, stupid memes that happen. Like there was a, for some reason, last week, somebody tweeted Board Ape Yacht Club. And then every single person was like, yeah, okay, I'm just going to tweet that. And it becomes this like iterative example. I mean, my feed was full of it because I just follow so many of these people. But, you know, you realize that like, oh, this this community is still here. Like this group is still like very much in it to be in it because being part of it is fun. And I think that element of NFTs is something that often gets lost again in the valuations that's really starting to come through in the bear market. And it's been really fun to see who sticks around. That's awesome. All right, Sam, same question. I'm really bullish. I'm, I can't believe I'm saying this. I'm probably super edgy in saying this, but I'm very bullish on video game NFTs. Video game NFTs, but you mean just NFTs within Web3 games? No, like NFTs that are mini games. Did oh, you see? Did you see Brian Brinkman's drop with um, Levels.art? Uh, what, what was it called? It's called the company is called Levels.art, um, and they released uh, a game called Cloud Poppers as an NFT that anyone can cool. play, but the, only up to a hundred could own. I'm like super bullish on that because this notion that art could also be gaming because what Brian Brinkman basically did was he reskinned the game. It's a classic game. It's just like you shoot at meteorites and they, they break into smaller pieces until you shoot them and they disappear. But the difference here is that Brian like reskinned the whole entire game. And it's now like this interactive piece of art that you can like tangibly play on your computer. I'm very bullish on that. I think that people are sleeping on it right now. That's super cool. Wow. Yeah. All right, Bryce, what is the best piece of advice you've ever received? Um, <laughs> that, that is a deeply heady question. I am going to go with two contradictory things can be true at the same time. There's a long and deep way to keep thinking, but it's just to remember that sometimes two people can be right, even when they disagree. Um, and that that's a really important skill to kind of foster within yourself is the ability to hold two conflicting ideas and consider them both. Um, without necessarily getting defensive of one or the other. That's awesome. All right, Sam, last question. What motivates you? Honestly, what motivates me is feeling like the people around me are as motivated as I am towards a project. It fires me up. When I see people like Bryce or Brian or my other team members at Metaversal working really hard at this one thing that we're trying to accomplish, I just go into fired up mode and I go bananas and it makes me feel like I could work forever because it's the things that I love to do. So I think for me, <laughs> if it hasn't already been very abundantly clear so far, I very much value human connection. And I think that that's what NFTs and web three really is all about. It's bringing all sorts of people together to be able to create this new iteration of art and creative content. And it like drives me to know to, to like an infinite end to be able to be with the right people in the same room, working towards a, a really valiant and good goal. Incredible. All right, Sam and Bryce, thank you so much for joining me. It, it's been an absolute blast. Uh, if you guys want to plug something, please, please do. Omega runners come join the discord, follow us on Twitter. You know, we have a lot of fun. We're really excited to launch shortly. Well, uh, when are you guys launching? soon, right? Yes. It'll happen in the next three weeks, two to three weeks. Awesome. All right, guys. Thank you so much. I will chat with you soon.